Hi, and welcome to lecture four. In this lecture, we're going to introduce the notion of reliability, which is one of the big topics in psychometrics. So to do this, we remind ourselves that one of the goals of psychological measurement is to be able to detect psychological differences. Well, what exactly does this mean? Well, this means we ask ourselves to what degree are differences in some observed test scores consistent with the differences in the true levels of some psychological trait. Now, there are some interesting ideas that pop up immediately from this, and that is the notion of how do we relate observed test scores, which we can see, all right, that's, that's the whole point of the word observed, with something that is a latent variable, this true levels of some psychological trait. We've addressed that issue in several places this semester already, and it will certainly be a big one here. So how exactly do we do this? Well, one way to answer this is to just assume some underlying mathematical model of our measurements, of the process of measurement. And the, the one that we're going to use in this lecture is one that's called classical test theory. Now, the, the typical references for classical test theory uh, come from a couple of textbooks. They're, they're fairly uh, well known in the field at this point. One is Lord Novick, uh, 1968. I don't have a copy of that one with me, but I do have a copy of the next one, which is Allen and Yen, 1979. And I'll show this to you real quickly. It's a reasonably thin book, but if you're at all mathematically inclined, it is an outstanding book. Um, if you if you like words more than formulas, then you'll want to go with something a little bit uh, more worked out. But this is a very uh, concise. Uh, crisp book and I really like how it presents um, it presents the the underlying ideas of classical test theory so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today actually comes right out of Allen and Yen so let's jump into it what exactly uh, does classical test theory mean what does it have to say for us well in classical test theory which you'll notice here that I have um, abbreviated CTT I'll do that throughout the lecture in classical test theory, what we do is we assume that all of the observed scores, which we're going to call X, can be written as a sum of two things. One is some true score, T, and the other is an error score, E. And so what we mean by that is basically we're writing all of our observed scores, X, as a composite of two uh, unobservable variables, a true score and uh, an error score. Now, there are some more assumptions that we also place on these. So there's a lot of ways you could do this, but we want to do this in such a way that the following assumptions hold. So further, we assume uh, first that the error scores are random. That is, there's no systematic error that's being uh, put into our testing situation. When we have these errors, they are errors that are due to any number of random factors. The second of these assumptions is that the mean of the error scores is zero. Now what that means, you'll see with a concrete example here in, in just a second, but essentially it means if, if your test overestimates the true score for some person, then it's going to underestimate it for another person so that over the whole set of test scores, the average of those errors is zero. And then finally, the last assumption of classical test theory is that the correlation between the true scores and the error scores is zero. In other words, the true score and error score are uncorrelated. Now these are all technical assumptions that are going to make things work out for us. I'm not gonna focus my lecture too much on these technicalities, but I will bring them up from time to time when their implications are useful. So I'll, I'll, I'll mention them a little bit later. So in general, the, the issue is that these true scores are latent. That is, we cannot observe them. But for now, just for this lecture, let's assume that we can. Let's ignore this notion and then just consider an example where we actually do know the true scores and, uh, and error scores that decompose our observed scores. Okay, so this is a very contrived example, but it will illustrate all the points that we wanna talk about today. So here are a set of six scores on some test, and we're gonna label the test X. So you can see participant A scored a 115, participant B scored a 135, et cetera. Now one thing you might immediately see from this test is that participant B has more whatever this test is measuring than participant A, because they scored a higher score. Now, if the test is reliable, 
then that difference will be reflective of the true underlying difference between participants A and B. That is, whatever this trait is that we're measuring, B will have more of it than A. So is that the case? Well, the only way to really know that is to know what are the underlying true scores and the associated error scores. So again, this is a big problem in measurement. Uh, you can't see these true scores, and so you're going to have to take it on faith that your scale is reliable enough that you can make that judgment. But for this example, let's assume that we have a magical divining rod that we can see the true scores and the error scores. And here they are. Okay? So the true score for participant A turns out to be 125, and that means that their error score is a minus 10. Why? Well, because if you have a true score of 125, to get an observed score of 115, that means that your true score, uh, that means that your observed test is underestimating it, right? So that's a negative 10 for the error score, right? Remember, in a classical test theory, the observed score is the true score plus the error score. So these two add, numbers add together to give you the 115. Same thing for the 135, right? Uh, participant B score to 135. Well, it turns out in this example that their true score is 115, which means their error score is 20. Okay, and then we just keep on going, and and you can see how the pattern works. Now, here's what's interesting about this example. Remember what we just first said before I uncovered everything. In fact, let me go back. From this test, from these data, we think that participant B has more of this trait than participant A because their observed score, 135, is higher than 115. But when we uncover the true scores, we see that is not the case. Actually, participant A has more of the trait. So this might begin to give us some indication that this test is not exactly reliable. It fails that fundamental idea of the observed scores reflecting differences in the true underlying traits. Now, what I want to do with these scores is I want to look at some of their statistical properties. To do that, instead of doing them by hand, I have put them in a little spreadsheet uh, saved it as a CSV file, and we're going to open this in JASP. So I'm going to pull up JASP real quickly. There it is. And I've already got the file in a convenient location. You can do this at home if you want. Again, just open up a spreadsheet, put in those data in those uh, columns that you saw, and then load it up in JASP. So let's see if I got it here. There it is. So I'm going to real quickly just change these all to scale. It doesn't matter too much here, but uh, let's be consistent. Okay, so this is the exact same data that we were just looking at with the observed scores in this column, the true scores here, and the error scores here. Let's just look at some descriptive statistics. Mainly, let's look at the means, the variances, and the standard deviations. So I'm going to go to descriptives, and I'm going to put all three of these in. And down here on statistics, I need to select variance because I do want to see that. Okay, so now here are our descriptive statistics. You can see that the mean of the observed scores is 100. Okay, again, this is a contrived example, so that's why it came out that way. The mean of the, uh, of the observed scores is 100. The mean of the true scores, you can see here, is also 100, which means that the mean of the error scores is zero. Remember, that was the first one of the first assumptions in classical test theory, that the errors have a mean of zero, okay? Uh, let's look at the standard deviations. Uh, you can see that the standard deviations are like this, 24.29, 18.708, and 15.492. There's no obvious relationship between those that you can see right now, but if you look at variance, so let's really focus on that, 590 for the variance of the observed scores, and 350 and 240 for the variances of the true scores and the error scores. That's kind of interesting. In fact, you might notice real quickly that if you take the variance of the true scores, 350, and the variance of the error scores that you get, and you add those together, you get 590. In fact, that is absolutely 100% true. You add the variances of these to get the variance of the total. You know why that is. Okay. You may have to go back to the last lecture that we did, but remember, if you think of the observed scores as a composite, that is, they are composed of true scores plus error scores, then you remember that variances add with some other stuff, right? We'll, we'll come back to that idea in a second. So 
Um, that's what we've noticed so far. Oh, here's one other thing you might want to look at. You might want to look at the correlation uh, between some things. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to regression and click correlation. I'm going to uh, check, check a couple of options here. I'm going to remove significance and display pairwise. It makes things a little easier to see. And I'm just going to compute the correlation between the true score and the error score. So I'm going to drag those over into my variables. And you'll see here the correlation between the true scores and the error scores is zero which is the other assumption of classical test theory. So if anything, we should be convinced with these data that our, um, that our example does fit the model of classical test theory. So I'm gonna pop back over to the uh, slide here. Let me go to a quick time player, there it is. I've rewritten all of those uh, descriptive statistics here for you. Again, the means, the variances, and the standard deviations. Now, real quickly, I know I said a bunch of things. Let's write them all down. Some things that you might note that we could check in JASP. We note that the mean error score is zero and the correlation between the true scores and error scores is zero. And finally, we also noted that if you take the variance of the observed scores, you can see it right up here, that it is the sum of the true score variance, which is 350, and the error score variance, which is 240. And why is that? Well, think about the variance of a composite, right? If you have a composite score X composed of two subtests, which that's what basically the true scores and error scores are, then it's the sum of those plus two times the correlation between the true and error scores. But you know the correlation between the true and error scores is zero. So that means that this little sum right here works out just perfectly, and that checks out here. Again, this is not how to compute these things. This is just something to note about the structure of these scores, okay? So, what about reliability, right? That's what this is all supposed to be about. It's not supposed to be a lecture on some abstract notions of classical test theory. So how does this all fit with reliability? Well, let's just figure out what reliability is and we'll use these ideas that we've begun to develop to really flesh those out. So it turns out there are two very closely related ideas about reliability that I want to define. The first of these is something that we call the reliability index. And the notation I need to introduce to you very quickly, it's this little symbol right here. It might look like a P to you. Turns out it's not a P, okay? It is a row. It's a Greek letter row. I'll just write that in real quick, R-H-O. And rho is the Greek letter for R. You know, you'll know in earlier lectures we used the symbol R to denote correlation coefficients, like, you know, if it was Pearson or point by serial or whatever, we would use R for that. Well, since these are correlations at sort of this uh, latent or population level, it's very standard, especially in classical test theory, to use the Greek letter to represent it, not the... Uh, not the Roman letter. So we're going to um, we're going to use that as well. So this is a row. Uh, you might be wondering, oh my goodness, how are you going to know the difference between P's and rows because those come up. I'll show you quickly how I do it. I'll erase this off of the notes, but you can see it here on the video. When I write a P, I do it that way. Okay, so you'll notice it's kind of in two segments. I, I do the vertical and then I do the little round part at the top. When I write a row, I tend to make it curvy and start at the bottom like that. And you can see those are quite different as I've put them together. So whatever you do, just make it consistent. I think the defining characteristic of the row is this little curved backbone. It's absolutely straight here for the P, but for row, it's, it's pretty curved. So uh, even so, rows are sometimes hard to write. Okay, that's enough of that. It is a row. And what is it? It is the reliability index. So it's denoted rho xt, and, and that means it's the correlation between the observed scores and the true scores. Now, right, reliability is supposed to be this uh, extent to which differences in measurement in the observed scores are related to differences in the underlying true scores. And so one way to characterize that is with this reliability index. It's simply you find the correlation between the observed scores and the true scores. Now there's another uh, number that we're going to define, and it's called the reliability coefficient. Now the difference here is one of them's called the index and one of them's called the coefficient. So you're going to need to keep those straight, and we will do so throughout the lecture today. It has a slightly different notation. 
It's this row with x, x prime, and you'll see in the next lecture why we call it that. For now, just accept that it's a different notation. But the reliability coefficient is defined as the fraction or ratio of true score variability, so variance, to observed score variability. Now in symbols, that would be written this way. That'd be written the true score variance, sigma squared t, divided by the observed score variance, sigma squared x. Okay? And if you want a way to conceptually think about that, you can think about it this way. Uh, you can think about the reliability coefficient as the ratio of signal to signal plus noise together, right? The idea being in classical test theory, we have an observed score. It's a true score signal plus uh, an error score, which is the noise. So uh, these are the ways to think about reliability. So reliability inde index and reliability coefficient. So let's compute these uh, for our example in JASP, okay? So before I jump to the answers here, we're gonna pop over to JASP and do some calculations. Um, but let's start with the reliability index. So the reliability index is the correlation between the observed scores and the true scores. Well, I bet we can do that in JASP. Let's go back to the data here. What we want is the, let's just put these all back over here and start from scratch. We want the correlation between the observed score and the true score, okay? And we do that and we see we get a correlation of 0.770, okay? So that's, that's pretty awesome. But here's one of the things that I want you to notice here. What I want you to notice is there's another way to get the 0 0.770. What is it? Well, let me hide this stuff real quick. And I wanna just try something. If you take the standard deviation of the true scores, which is 18.708, and you divide by the standard deviation of the observed scores, 24.290, let's try that, I'll pop a calculator up here, 18.708 divided by 24.290, you'll notice that the answer is 0 0.770. It's the same as that correlation. Oh my goodness, is that an accident? Oops, wrong thing, hang on. Is that an accident? Does this correlation always equal this ratio right here? And the answer is absolutely it does. This is a nice little mathematical fact in classical test theory. You can prove, and we're not gonna do it here. If you are interested in doing this proof yourself, uh, let me know and I'll be happy to guide you through it. But you can prove mathematically that under the assumptions of classical test theory, the correlation between the observed scores x and the true scores t is equal to the ratio of the true score standard deviation divided by the observed score standard deviation. In other words, reliability index can also be defined as this fraction here, okay? So that's interesting. Uh, right now it's just sort of interesting though. I mean, it's like, why, why do we really even care? Well, we're going to see in a second why we might care about this, but hold on to that. Now let's also do the same thing for reliability coefficient. Okay, so reliability coefficient, remember it's slightly different. It's the ratio of signal to, no, uh, to signal plus noise. It's the true score variance divided by the true score, or sorry, observed score variance. Uh, the fact that there's a square here is very important because reliability coefficient deals with variances, not standard deviations. Standard deviations, that's the reliability index. Again, big difference between index and coefficient here, and the difference is one of them is on the level of standard deviation, whereas the other is on the level of variances. So let's compute this. Well, we need to know what our, um, what our variances were. We can go back to our chart and find those. So this is the true score variance divided by the, um, the observed score variance. If we go back to our chart and look, that was 350 divided by 590. And now what does that turn out to be? Well, let's just pop up the calculator again. 350 divided by 590 turns out to be 0 0.59 and some change. So I'm going to simply write that as 0 point, uh, 0 0.59, okay? So this is the reliability coefficient. Now, what do we do with this? Well, first thing we might wanna do is interpret it. What the heck does it mean? And the way we interpret it is this. This is a nice standard uh, way to think about what reliability means. Reliability means, in this case, that 59, oops, let me uh, undo that, that 
that's this number, of the variability in the observed scores is in the observed scores is due to variability in the underlying true scores. In other words, this is just a relative proportion of variability that's due to this source right here, true score variability. So this tells you that only around almost 60% of the variability that we're seeing in those observed scores is really reflecting the true score variability. That's not a surprise, right? I mean, we saw earlier that, um, you know, you can't always assume that just because there's a, a specific relationship between the observed scores that it carries over to the true scores as well. So if you want to be a little more pessimistic, you might think about this the opposite way. Yes, 59% of the variability in the observed scores is due to variability in the true scores, but this tells you that 41% of the observed variability is coming from measurement error. Now, that seems like a pretty big number, and in fact, it absolutely is. Clearly, we want our reliability coefficients to be closer to 100%. We want them to be closer to one. In fact, you're gonna see in the next lecture, uh, in the field classically, we've always wanted this number to be as close to 80% or above as possible. And uh, you know, there's, there's arguments about what, what threshold you should have, but clearly bigger is better here. You want more of the, of the variability in the observed scores to reflect true scores, not error scores, okay? So you might be thinking at this point, okay, fine. Reliability coefficient, that's this ratio of variances. Reliability index, oh, well, that's a correlation. Or it turns out it's the ratio of two standard deviations. But I want to know about reliability. Why do I have these multiple ways to think about reliability? Why do I call one of them an index? Why do I call the other one a coefficient? Well, it turns out that they are intimately related to each other. And so instead of separating them, we just kind of take them both together. And how is it that they're intimately related? Well, they're intimately related in the following way. Let's follow what's going on in this yellow box. If we start with the reliability coefficient, that's this symbol right here, by definition, that's equal to this ratio, right? The, the true score variance divided by the observed score variance. But mathematically, a square over a square is the same as the fraction squared. And we know from what we just figured out earlier that this fraction is the correlation between the true and observed scores, this rho xt. So it turns out that reliability, this number right here, is the squared correlation between true scores and observed scores. It is, and I'm going to make a little note here, it is not equal to the correlation between the true scores and the observed scores. It is, however, equal to the squared correlation. So very, very important concept there. So reliability is a squared correlation. Okay, now let's, if you need to pause the video, we've been talking about a lot, right? So pause the video, go get you know, a cup of coffee or something. We'll take stock of where we are, okay? All right, I assume you're back. What have we done? Well, actually what we've done, if you go back and follow every step is we've developed two equivalent ways to think about reliability. We thought about reliability as this, right? The proportion of variability that's due to the true scores. We now know that reliability is equal to the squared correlation between T and X, between the true scores and observed scores. Turns out there's even more ways to think about reliability. We're gonna end with four of them. Let's go ahead and look at these last two, these other equivalent ways to think about reliability. So the third one, let's just work out mathematically what this turns out to be, okay? If I start with the definition of reliability, of the reliability coefficient, as again, the ratio of true score variance to, um, to observed score variance, I can do a little mathematical trick. I can say, well, this is equal to what I get when I take the total variance minus the error variance, like this, right? And then I divide by the total score variance, observed variance, if you will. And then if I simplify this by dividing this term in the denominator into both parts, then I can write it as this, one minus sigma squared e, so the error score variance, divided by sigma squared x.
And in fact, that is now our third way to think about reliability. And the, what, what we do is we say that reliability is what is left over after you remove the error variability, okay? So this is just telling you, again, another way to think about what the reliability coefficient tells you. Let's apply that to our example. Um, in our example that we had, we had a reliability coefficient equal to, well, let's see. Uh, by this, this tells us that it's one minus the error variance divided by the um, the divided by the observed score variance. Let's pop back over to Jasper real quick and remind ourselves what those are. That's going to be 240 over 590. Okay, so let's write those down. This will be one minus 240 over 590. Okay. And if I figure out what that is, well, let's open up the calculator. One minus 240 oops, divided by 590. And you'll notice it turns out to be 0 0.59. Now, is that a surprise? Well, hopefully not, because again, the reliability coefficient is what we found earlier to be 0.59, okay? This is just telling you that if you think about reliability in this way, looks different, but it's absolutely equivalent, that it's still 0 0.59. That number, that magical number that's supposed to reflect reliability is going to be consistent. It's just this time, conceptually, it's a slightly different thing. It's what's left over after removing error variability this time. Let's look at the last one, the fourth one. Okay. So once again, let's start with what we just found out. We just found out that the reliability coefficient is what's left over when you remove the error variability. So in symbols, it's that guy right there. Well, I can write this as the following. This is sigma e over sigma x, all that squared. Okay. And why did I do that? Well, remember from what we did earlier, when you have sigma e over sigma x, that's the correlation between those two. So this turns out to be one minus the correlation row between the observed scores and the error scores squared. Okay, so in interpretation, that tells us that reliability is the lack of correlation between the observed scores and the error scores, particularly the lack of squared correlation, but, uh, but nonetheless, there it is. So yes, a fourth way to look. Let's see if we compute reliability this way if we still get 0.59. It turns out we absolutely do. So if you start with this formula that we just developed and you work through, well, we need to figure out what the correlation between X and E, right? The observed scores and the error scores. Well, we can do that in JASP. Let's go back over here and we'll take all these out and we'll compute the observed scores, X, and error scores. And we see the correlation there is 0.638. So let's put that in here. And if we take 1 minus 0.638 squared, uh, say it's 0.59, let's see that. 1 minus 0.638 squared is 0 0.59. So we get exactly the same, uh, exactly the same reliability coefficient. Very nice. Okay, quick summary, and then we'll almost be done. We have four ways to think about reliability. In the next lecture, we'll talk about how to actually estimate reliability from scales. But for now, we just need to know what the heck it is. Reliability is, well, first, it's the proportion of variance in the observed scores that is due to variability among the true scores. Memorize this, write it down. In, in a formula, it looks like that, okay? It is also, as we saw, the squared correlation between the observed and true scores. So as a formula, it's rho squared xt. Again, it's not the correlation, it's the squared correlation. And then we've got the two sort of negative relationships. We've got that it's what's left over after we remove error variability, which was that formula. And finally, we've got it's the lack of correlation between the observed and error scores. So these are all four equivalent ways to think about the relationship or the, to think about reliability of a scale. So that's all well and good. We could stop there, but you would probably be a little disappointed because you would probably be asking, um, why are we not actually talking about what this is useful for? This is just some sort of big conceptual idea. What can we do with it? What's it good for? 
Well, certainly one thing it's good for is it's a diagnostic for your test. It, again, tells you the extent to which you can believe the relationships that are implied by your test. But it also turns out that it's absolutely useful for indexing the expected measurement error of your test. And I want to illustrate why that's the case. So recall, one of our notions of reliability is that it's the lack of error variance, right? So it's one minus sigma squared E over sigma squared X. So if you solve for sigma E, right, the standard deviation of the error score, that's gonna be your expected measurement error here. If we just solve that equation, well, first thing we'll do is get the term involving sigma E by itself. So that's this guy right here. Put everything else on the right-hand side of the equation. So that'll be one minus the reliability coefficient. Now we'll multiply both sides by the uh, observed score variance, sigma squared X. That's gonna look something like this. And then if we wanna solve for sigma E, right, the standard deviation of the error score, we just take the square root of both sides. Now, taking the square root of this term just makes the uh, square go away, and then we take the square root of the 1 minus the reliability coefficient. So I've highlighted this formula because this is your estimate of the measurement error. As long as you know the standard deviation of the observed scores and you know the reliability coefficient, then those plug into a nice formula to give you your expected measurement error. Let's do a quick example of that. Remember, for our example, we saw four ways that the relation, that the, uh, I keep saying relationship here, that the reliability coefficient is 0.59. So if we plug in these things, go back to JASP, you'll figure out that sigma x, the standard deviation of the observed scores, was 24.29 times square root of 1 minus 0.59. If you do all that, then you get this. Yes, oops, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. When you do that, you get this. You get 15.55 points right, where points is whatever the units of the test are. So on average, your observed scores are going to differ by 15.55 points. Uh, this tells you a way to figure out the margin of error or a confidence interval for your uh, true score estimates, right? When you wanna do a 95% margin of error to do things like um, you know, confidence intervals or whatever, well, you might remember from your stats class, you simply take the standard deviation and you multiply by 1.96, right? That gets you almost two standard deviations away, which covers about 95% of the possible things under the normal curve. So if we were gonna find a uh, margin of error for this test, well, we would just take 1.96 times that expected error and we would get 30.48 points. So whatever, um, whatever measurement we gave for someone, we would know then that we take that measurement plus or minus 30.48 points, and that's gonna give you a confidence interval for the true score that you're supposed to be measuring, okay? So that's the end of this lecture. The big ideas here are uh, what's reliability, and we had four different ways to look at what the reliability coefficient meant. So definitely go back and look at those. Those were these guys right here, okay? And we did figure out that there was one uh, immediately useful consequence of reliability, and that is it can help you figure out uh, what your expected error is, which relates then to the notion of confidence intervals. So uh, next time, in the next lecture, we'll talk about how to actually compute these reliability coefficients. Because if you remember, the ones in this video dealt with a very contrived example where I actually knew the true scores and error scores. In general, you won't know that. So we've got to be a little more clever about how to estimate it. But that's next lecture, and I will look forward to guiding you through that then. For now, that's it, and I'll see you next time.